Let's pray together once again. Would you bow with me? And God Almighty, we just invite you to be in this place today. Holy Spirit, come. Inhabit the praises of your people. Fulfill your promise that if even two of us are gathered together, you're there with us, among us, within us. God, work today. I pray I would be invisible, that we would see you, that it would not be my words, but your word. The truth of your word and the power of you, the Holy Spirit, in this place today, we dedicate this time, this people, this place. God, these moments now, may we encounter the living God in a deeply personal and powerful life-changing way. May the name of Jesus be glorified. In his name we have gathered and prayed and everyone said in one mighty voice, say it. And I invite you to be seated in his presence. What a day in the house of the Lord. We could just quit right there. After thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied, man, that's, that's enough for the service right there. Uh, we have been working our way through this series. Uh, we call it We Believe. And I probably shouldn't say this, uh, again, because it hasn't worked very well the last couple of weeks, but I'm praying. And I, I said, it's not like believing that the Steelers are going to win today, okay? Uh, we do believe that, but this is something deeper than that. We really trust, when we say we believe in God, we believe in Christ, we actually are putting our trust, we're putting our lives in his hands. It's not something we just believe here, it is something that we believe here. And my prayer is this, is that today you wouldn't just believe in God as some kind of a mental affirmation, but it would be because of a heart change. This message is not just informational, but it's transformational. Change your life. And we have been talking about what it is that we believe. I've been using the uh, Apostles' Creed as kind of our framework for this. And so I want us to read in one mighty voice what we have done so far with this creed. And we're gonna pull that up. Can we say this together in concert? Say it. I Come on, a little louder. The Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Can we say that one more time? I believe in the Holy Spirit. That was last week's message. The great news that God is in you, that God has sent his helper, his advocate, his paraclete to come and take up residence within you, that he's not the God who's out there somewhere, that if you're a follower of Jesus, listen, God has put his spirit in you. Is that incredible? That was the message last week, and I'm not gonna have time today to kind of go back and recap that, but the message for today is this. It's the next line right here. Say it. Say that one more time. Now, don't get hung up on this word Catholic, because you might say, I thought we were a Baptist church. Uh, you know, I, this word Catholic here is not a noun like the Byzantine Catholic or the Roman Catholic. This word Catholic here is actually an adjective to describe the church. And it means that there is a universal church. There are Christians that are meeting all over the globe on, on this Lord's day, but we are all the church, the church capital C. You know what I'm saying? That is the universal, the Catholic church. Um, actually, the word in the original language is the word ecclesia, God's people gathering together. At what 1 Corinthians 12 says, by the spirit, we are all baptized into one body. And that body is the Catholic, the universal church. I just wanna to talk to you about the church today for just a couple minutes because I love you, church. Have I told you lately that I love you? I'm not gonna sing Rod Stewart here this morning. I don't have any voice left to sing anything after the first service, but I love the church. No one has to prompt me to get up and go to church. You may have to wake me up to go other places. I love to come and be in the church. I love the church people. And I'm not saying it's always easy, but I don't believe that you can experience all that God has for you in isolation. And there are some people that watch online out of necessity, and I'm glad we do it online. But there's power when God's people come together, amen? When we are united in praise, 
When God comes, as he said in the Old Testament, he inhabits the praises of his people. I love that idea that even if two of us are gathered together, the living God is here with us when we gather, when we pray in unity. Man, there is power when God's people agree, as the Bible says to. There's something amazing, supernatural that takes place when the saints of God come together in one place. And I love to be part of that. I've loved it since the day I became a believer in 1985. And I've loved it ever since. I love the church. But I want to be the first to admit today, and let's admit, the church isn't perfect. We're people who are, we're sinners in need of a savior. And people will say, they'll criticize the church. They'll say the church, you know, has had moral failures and abuses. And there's been exploitation. Listen, I just want to tell you, true. But here's the truth. Those people that did things in the church are not Jesus. Amen? Amen. Because we serve a perfect savior today. We are a people in need of a savior. And that's the one we celebrate today, not people. It's God, the leader of our church. My prayer is that you would line up behind Jesus. I don't care what your church affiliation is or what your past experience with church is. My question is, will you line up behind Jesus? Not will you line up behind me or anyone else, just Jesus. I love his church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. We are his light bearers. People have said, well, the church is no longer relevant. It was relevant in our parents' generation, but it's not irrelevant today. I mean, after all, we're so enlightened, we're so educated. And I just wanna tell you this, I disagree strongly. I believe, and I'm a huge believer in the mission of the local church. I believe it's important to have crusades and people that travel and preach and preach on television, but I want to tell you what will change our nation. It is the living God working through the local church, and we are part of that. That's a privilege, a privilege to be part of God's plan, his salvation plan here on this planet. That's what we are. I'm I'm believing in a strong future for the church and its people. I believe it. I I believe, I know this to be true, that the church is going to be here a long long time after I am gone. God's people. And many times we see, you know, in in the spotlight, all the things that have gone wrong in the church. I want to tell you something. We wouldn't be where we are without the church of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we never see the things the church is doing in the name of Jesus Christ. I actually, you know, I'm not as cool as all the other pastors here at the church. They ride motorcycles. That's cool, man. They hunt. This, this hunting thing last night, Pastor Trent brought the house down here last night. I didn't realize, I, I know Trent well, I didn't realize how much he loved hunting. I mean, he really is into hunting. And, uh, and you know, that, that's, that's not kind of my thing. It used to be. I kind of got away from it when my father passed away. But you know what my thing is, is running. And I think I'm the only one. <laughs> and recently, I've been running the rivers around Pittsburgh which might sound boring, but man, I really experienced God in that. And this weekend, I went running down the Allegheny River. And as I was running down toward the North Shore where Heinz Field is, I still call it Heinz Field, I don't care what they call it. (laughs) There were tents. And I was naive enough to think, there's a baseball game today, and people are camping out here for the baseball game? Maybe football in Pittsburgh, maybe not the baseball game. And I realized, no, These are homeless people living here. And the incredible thing is they all have nice tents. Their tents are nicer than my tent. (laughs) I started to wonder about that. Saw a guy that appeared to be homeless screaming at some people. And my first instinct was to go and tell him, hey, keep it quiet, buddy. But I realized this guy appeared to be homeless, probably had mental illness. And God began to teach me something in that little run down the river that I did not expect. And there's a, there's a community of people, actually, uh, homelessness in Pittsburgh is up 21% this year just because of the economy. And there are people down there, and they get dislocated. They no longer have an address. And so they, from, from what the, 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 the newsreel that I read here this past weekend, just to study this, they can't get back on the rolls again. They can't get back into society again. The city's trying to do something about it, but there's still a lot of people living down there. And you know why they live there? You know why they live in that particular location? Because it is right by the Light of Life mission. And I am really just so honored to say that we sent two mission trips to the Light of Life mission this year. That's their lifeline for the homeless. 
It's the church. It's Christians. It's not anyone else. For the most part, it's believers. And I wonder, where these people got these tents? I started to research it. And you know what I found out? There are Christians that are giving homeless people tents in Pittsburgh. See, many times we lose track of what the church is doing in a positive way in the name of Jesus. I mean, I want to tell you that most of the hospitals that we have in this amazing medical community that we have were started originally by the church. That's why they have names like Presbyterian and St. Elizabeth's and Mercy. The church has impacted our society in an incredible way. And listen, my friends, we are the church. Is that incredible? Our educational system, most of the Ivy League colleges, the elite academic schools in the world originally were started by the church. I mean, the church has done incredible things in our society in the name of Jesus. And yet, in many circles, the church is looked down upon, criticized, rejected, persecuted. It began with the stoning of Stephen in the book of Acts. There has always been opposition to the church of Christ. So if you want to be countercultural, you're in the right place. If you want to do something that is not mainstream, you are in the right place. Because the church has been persecuted since the beginning. In fact, if you study Roman history, there were actually 11 Roman rulers that persecuted the church over a period of like three centuries. 11. And they actually slaughtered people from the church. Generation after generation. But here's the deal. You cannot stop the church. You cannot stop the church. Somebody said you can't stop a train. Oh, yeah, you can stop a train, but you cannot stop the church. Nations have come and gone. Superpowers have come and gone. Philosophers have come and gone. Generations have come and gone. Social architects have come and gone, but the church remains. You cannot stop the church. The one thing on earth, the only organization that Jesus Christ started is the church. His church will not be stopped. And we are the church. That's something to celebrate today. I'm excited to be part of this community that God is using. And the way he is using this community in Lawrence County, Mercer County, and around this area, I'm just, I'm just trying to stay faithful to it and ride the wave and enjoy what the Holy Spirit is doing in this church community. Incredible. Incredible. Now, I want to go back to the very beginning of the church, and I just want to talk about this for a moment. First of all, we're going to be in Matthew 16, a conversation that took place between Jesus and his apostles where Jesus begins to talk about his church. It's in a place called Caesarea Philippi. That location was named after two rulers of the Roman Empire, Augustus Caesar and Philip. They worshipped other gods. They worshipped in this, in this city. They worshipped the gods of Rome, yes, but also the gods of Greece and false gods and, and immorality was everywhere. But it was in that place, the Son of God, the sinless Savior, Ask his disciples, who do people say that I am? And I want to pick up this conversation in verse 15. And Jesus says this to his disciples, and he's saying this to us right now. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Who do you say that Jesus is? You. You. How you answer that question, I'm going to tell you from experience, will determine an awful lot about your life. Will determine an awful lot about the trajectory and the quality of your life. And it will also determine your eternal destiny. Jesus says, who do you say I am? Every person must answer that question. And even if you decide not to answer the question, you still have made a choice. I think that was a song at one time. I'm not sure. All right? Simon Peter answered. Simon Peter, many times the one to speak up first. And he says something that is so powerful. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Can I preach on that for just a moment? Because he makes a statement here that we all need to hear and we all need to echo that Jesus, you are in a category all of your own. You are the one true Messiah, the Christ. 
You are the son of the living God, not some false God that they're worshiping down the street in these, in these places where they're worshiping the Roman gods and the Greek gods, these temples. But you are the son of the one true living God. You're, you're, you're in a category all by yourself. Listen, if Jesus is not the Christ, think about this. Let's all go home right now. Let's go home and watch the NFL today. Let's go home and watch Newsweek. If Jesus is not the Christ, we really have nothing to offer the world. We're a civic club. We're a country club. Nothing wrong with a country club, but that's not who we are. We're pretenders. But think about this. If Jesus is the Christ, think of the potential that has. In this generation or any generation, think about how relevant that message is (laughs) for our society, a message that everyone needs to hear, that he and he alone is the Messiah, God in the flesh. And so Jesus responds to him in verse 17. He says this, blessed are you. That is what we call a beatitude. God speaking a blessing on someone. Blessed are you, Simon. Simon and Peter, the same person. Son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. In other words, Peter, you didn't hear this from a rumor. You didn't hear it through the gossip mill. God show you this. That's the the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I said this last week, if it were not for the Holy Spirit, none of us would know Jesus. God calls us to himself. The Holy Spirit is the one who leads us into the open arms of Jesus Christ. Amen? This is a revelation right here. Right? Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but God in heaven, the Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. In other words, I'm changing your name, Peter. You're you're, you're like other people. You used to be kind of this person who was just a a natural person. But now you are going to live a life with a supernatural God living within you. You're going to be different. It's going to be different. And on this rock, and the rock not being Peter, but the rock being this revelation, this truth. On this rock, Jesus says, I am. Will. Can you say, I will? Say it again. These are the words of Christ. I will build my church. You cannot stop the church, and even the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, will not overcome it. Actually, one theologian said it this way, the policy and power of Satan himself will not overcome the church, though he try. The church is unstoppable. I will build my church. He doesn't say, I could build it, I might build it, I'm probably gonna build it. No, the son of the living God says, I'll build my church. And that's us. That's something to celebrate today, to be part of that. You know, I was thinking about 9-11, and I remember in 2001, when this whole attack took place, the church attendance really grew in America. And the church where I was serving, all of a sudden, we had special gatherings and community gatherings, and we got people counseling, and we went out into the community, and we really stepped up, and we did something as a church that we tried to be a part of the solution for this whole crisis that we found ourselves in. I really felt like it was the church's finest hour in my life, my lifetime. You know, in in the middle of all this, when people were looking for answers, in fact, I was reading some statistics from 2001 from the Pew Foundation. They said in 2001, 78% of the people in America believed that that the church's influence was growing. It's the most ever. Like, this was our finest hour. We stepped out. We demonstrated compassion and love to people. There were people praying in a society that was so politically correct People suddenly were praying. Public officials were gathering together to pray. People were reminded about our mortality. And as hard as it was, people came to Christ. Our church at the time was packed with people. I mean, we grew by hundreds of people in the middle of that. People began to realize that, listen, our lives are fragile and our way of life is fragile and we need God. And the church was really, at, at that time, happy to step up and really Share Christ with people. Fast forward 20 years. 
another national crisis. But in this national crisis, it's different. The church is polarized. The church has moral failures going on in some of the biggest cities in the world. The church has been insulted and rejected, and there are Christian leaders that are calling it the second exodus. And I'm not talking about new life, but I'm talking about the church capital C. I have a friend that's part of the leadership of a really good church in Western PA, a really good church, and he told me recently, our young people just never came back after that. Never came back. 53%, according to the Barna organization, 53% of the people in America never go to church. And in 2020, one in five stopped attending. 50% of millennials, which is the largest segment of our society, over 70 million people, don't have any interest in attending church at all. Why? Why is that? Can we blame someone else for it? Or have we missed an opportunity, especially in the last two years? I believe we have. I say that because I am the church. I believe in the last couple of years, in many circles, the church got up, caught up in arguing about COVID policies more than arguing for the gospel of Christ. I really believe this. I think people, God's people, in many circles, were more interested in winning a political argument than winning people for the gospel. In a season when people needed to understand and know the love and compassion of Jesus, they didn't see that. It is easy for us to blame the culture and those people, whoever those people might be. We're the people of God. And we can take personal responsibility. I, I believe that to be a Christian is to take personal responsibility. It's what it's all about. I take personal responsibility for my actions. Am I acting like Jesus? Am I acting according to his word? Listen, we are called, this is a privilege we have, we are called to influence the world for Christ. It's what we try to do as a church in a big way, every single day of the week, to represent, listen to me, the one true ruler and king over everything else. And this is huge because there are destructive ideologies dominating our culture. Secularism and humanism, I want to encourage you this year to get out and vote, but I don't want you to go vote unless you know who you're voting for. I want you to study the candidates. We're going to have some resources here before the election. We can't endorse a candidate, but we can tell you what the candidates stand for, and you can go and you can vote having been educated, right? Candidates that represent your Christian values and represent the Word of God, that is great. I think every Christian should be out and should be voting. It's a responsibility that we have. But listen, the solution in our nation goes far beyond choosing the right candidates. It's so much bigger than that. How the church responds right now is huge. And I believe we have been given an opportunity right now in our own community to be the light of the world, as Jesus says we are. So I want to go back to the very beginning of the church. And I want, to, I want you to listen to the first sermon. This first sermon was given by the Apostle Peter, this same guy that just had the conversation with Jesus. And it was there on, on Pentecost that the Holy Spirit came, and suddenly this Peter, who was a, really an uneducated fisherman, became bold. With God inside him, he went from being Simon to being Peter, to being God's messenger. And here's his message. First of all, it was this, and this is what we need to be, Christ-centered. The first thing he does is start talking about Jesus. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. He goes right to Jesus, points them to Jesus. Listen, today, I don't know if you're a visitor here. Maybe you came for the baptisms. Maybe you came because your wife made you come or your husband made you come or your mother-in-law made you come. Whatever, whatever reason you're here today, don't look to me. I just want to point you to Jesus. 
the author and perfecter of our faith. I can't save anybody. And that's what he does. He points him right to Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God. Let me ask this question. What are you passionate about? I mean, you may have a lot of different passions. I was reminded last night that people are really passionate about two things, hunting and eating. There's a whole lot of eating that went on in this room last night. I mean, you wouldn't believe the amount of, wow, there's a lot of food here. We come into church, hey, where'd you eat this weekend? What, I got a restaurant for you. You know, it's like we have a passion about eating, recreational eating. And I love it. I think we should be passionate about it. You know, we're passionate about a lot of other things. There are some people, you, they won't say anything to you until you start talking about politics, and they won't stop talking. Some people are just passionate about politics. Maybe it's, it's, it's what series you're watching on the streaming service. Like, we're, you know, that's a conversation sometimes in our meetings. What are you guys watching? You watching anything good? You know, we're passionate about our entertainment in our society. I think that's all right. Sports, many people go home today, you watch that football game, we're still believing we're going to win this game today, and this new QB is going to come through. You know what? There's a lot of things that we can be passionate about, and that's fine. But if you really want to come to life and really experience the abundant life, your primary passion must be Christ himself. That is where our church will have an impact, when we're like Peter. When the first thing we want to do is point people to Jesus. Not about me. It's about Christ. Listen, I don't want my name on a plaque. I don't want my name, on, I don't want my picture up on the wall. Don't say this is Warren's church. This church belongs to Jesus Christ. It's his church. All right? The message that we give in this church is always going to be Christ. That's it. The motivation that we have is always going to be Christ. No matter what we talk about here, we're always going to bring it back to Christ in every gathering, at every age level, in our music, in our message, in everything, Christ-centered. Peter did not get up and preach philosophy. He did not get up and talk about what he was against. He did not get up and talk about world events, and I think we should talk about world events in church, but we need to bring it back to what Christ says about those events in his word. Christ-centered. I mean, 20 centuries have come by since that sermon, come and gone since that sermon, but Jesus is still at the center. He's still the centerpiece of humanity. Christ-centered. Christ-centered. Serving Christ. And listen, when you come in here, I want to give you Christ, but listen, you need to seek Christ for yourself. I mean, it can't just be for an hour on Sunday morning. Like those people with that banquet here last night, they're like, you need to be able to feed yourself. You know what I'm saying? You need to fill up on Jesus. You need to get in his word and make him your absolute first passion in life and see what God does. See what God does in your life. That's the first part of his message. Here's the second part, the cross. The cross is central in the church. The Apostle Paul said, I preach Christ and Christ crucified. We just sang, thank, that's one of my favorite tunes. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Awesome. That's the message, the cross. This man, Peter said, was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. Now, you know what jumps out at me in that statement? It was God's deliberate plan, the scripture says, to crush him, right? Christ crucified. That's what the world needs to hear. Jesus was not a martyr, like many other martyrs. He's a savior. God knew his, in his foreknowledge, this was pre-planned, that Jesus would come and die upon that cross. And the cross, why the cross? Why would Jesus shed his blood on the cross? I sat in church and wondered that. Why would God do it that way? He was our substitute. Because we're sinners, we deserve death. Jesus died the death that we, that I, that you deserved on that cross. People need to hear that message. He came for the just. He came for the unjust. Sin had to be paid for. And Jesus paid for that sin. Now, here's the deal. I know there are people that come in in a crowd this size. There are people that come in today. You're carrying guilt in your life for, for something, and it may be something huge. 
You may be carrying guilt that no one else even knows about. Your spouse may not even know about it. You may have carried it for years. What you did to someone, a mistake you made a long time ago, something you didn't do that you should have done, you feel like maybe you failed with your children, whatever it might be. I am telling you that people walk around, I believe most people walk around with a sense of guilt and shame. But I want you to know that this, God took your guilt and your shame to the cross. That's a message that our world needs to hear. To experience grace and experience what I needed so desperately and still need, and that is the forgiveness, the restoration, the personal revival that comes with the message of the cross. So if you have sin in your life today, listen, now's the time. Confess and accept God's forgiveness. One of the themes that we have on our Bible study on Wednesday night, which is really one of the overarching mega themes of the Bible, is this. God honors those who honor him. Amen? Are we honoring God with the way we live our lives? I'm going to say this one more time, then I'm going to, get, I'm going to move on so we don't have a traffic jam after this service. God honors those who honor him. There is a God of restoration. Revival, and it comes through the cross, the message of the cross. That's the second thing. Christ, his cross, and here's the third thing Peter emphasizes, the resurrection. Our world needs to know that we serve a resurrected savior, that he's not just the same as other religious leaders who have come and gone, who are buried somewhere. Listen, our God reigns. Jesus Christ lives forever. Listen to what Peter says in verse 24. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Can I say that one more time? Because I just want to hear it one more time. It was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. The miracle of the resurrection, my friends, that's a message that our world needs to hear. That's what we need to be telling people. The majesty of his reign Listen, if we don't believe in the resurrection, our faith is dead. It's null and void. Our God is resurrected from the dead. And I could stand up here and give you a bunch of reasons why I not only believe that to be true, but know it to be true. But here's what I want to say. One reason, the main reason is, is because he has changed my life so dramatically. And he's given me a hope and a life that I never would have had any other way. I told my wife recently, if it wasn't for you and the Holy Spirit, I think I'd be dead by now. Maybe you feel that same way. Someone said, I'm making Jesus Lord of my life. No, he's already Lord. He's the risen Lord and Savior. You may receive him, the free gift of salvation he offers. And here's the great news. He's coming again. I look forward to that day. Even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come. The gospel, that's what the world needs to hear. I want to give you just a couple things before we leave here. Because if we are going to reach people for Christ, we need to have a theology, a mindset of how to do that. And I want to give you this very quickly today because I know we want to get out of here and get to brunch and the next crowd needs to come in. I got this from Redeemer Church in New York City, Tim Keller. And this is kind of my own version, but I don't want to take credit for it. I call it the theology of outreach. How are we going to reach our community for Christ? Write this down, rewatch it on the video. We're probably going to publish this somewhere. This is going to be a recurring theme in our church right here. You ready for this? This is how we change. This is what we do going forward. The first dynamic is this, humble. If Jesus Christ was anything, he was humble. Humbled himself, took the form of a servant, became obedient to death, even death upon a cross. God resists the proud, but he shows grace. He shows favor to the humble. How is the church doing with humility. I don't think very well. I believe that the barrier between us and the world out there in many cases is pride. There's a lot of pride in the church. It's referred to as pharisaical evangelism. You know what I mean by that? The the, the attitude of the Pharisees, pharisaical evangelism is, is this, this is what it is. I'm right, 
you're wrong, and I love to tell you about it. That is ineffective. People tried that on me for years. I'm right, you're wrong, and I love to tell you how right I am. Pride. There is a smugness, if that's a word, that comes many times with being a Christian. We're right. We don't need to tell people we're right. We have Jesus. We don't need to prove it to anyone. Listen, I want to tell you this. It is only by the grace of God that I'm not living down by the river in Pittsburgh. There's nothing I did. There's nothing for me to be smug about. It is only by him. We need not be condescending toward the people that exist outside this church. We need to treat people with respect to demonstrate the love and the compassion of Jesus, to compel people to Jesus. Listen, when you're talking to someone else, even if you're not talking about Jesus, if you're just connecting with someone else, they may be a great person. They may be better than I am in some ways, but they don't know Jesus, and they need the gospel. That idea of treating people with respect, I'm just gonna say to you, is not coming through in the church today. Just not, in many circles. There's a lot of pride, and I see it online more than anywhere else. Interacting with people. I heard one pastor that you might recognize his name interacting with an atheist online here recently. Sounded like he was punishing this person. I'm like, you're kidding. No one was saved. No one was persuaded. Humility. I'm no better than my neighbor. I'm only here by the grace of God. I'm just happy to be on Jesus' team. I'm just happy to be his ambassador. Humility. To walk with humility. God resists the proud, but shows grace to the humble. Let's, just, let's, let's go down the road of humility and just see what God does. Here's the second thing. Fearless. Fearless. There are more scriptures which give us the commandment to not be afraid than any other commandment in all of the Bible. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind, right? So what are we afraid of in sharing Jesus with other people? I mean, I don't think we walk out of here and start just beating people over the head with Jesus. It takes a relationship. It takes a connection. But we need not be Fearful. The only thing we should be fearful would be that we confuse someone else or they get offended. You know, I really believe many times we don't share Jesus with people because we don't want to be disliked. What would they think if they knew? I was a Christian. Somebody asked me one time, are you born again? And I said, yes. And you're kidding. This is a long time ago. And so we're afraid we're going to, what would they think? I mean, you know, what, what would they think if they found out that I'm actually a follower of Jesus? Listen, here's what, I, here's what I've come to realize after many years of this. I am secure in Christ. My identity is in Christ, not in what other people think. I'm going to find my identity in Jesus. And I could give you a, a number of illustrations that I'm not going to this morning about people who are able to live that out in a way. They compelled so many people to Christ. Have we put ourselves out there? You know, the other night, I came Thursday night uh, to celebrate recovery because there's an amazing testimony happening. And I wanted to come in here. It is incredible. <laughs> Those of you that were in that meeting, you'll know what I mean. If you weren't, you're welcome to come this Thursday night. Well, last Thursday night, they served hot dogs. That was another reason I came, about food. Those hot dogs were great, Trent. I don't know where you are, but you did a good job with hot dogs. And I came in, and I'm walking around here in the church, and this guy comes up to me. He's a great guy. I'd never, I'd never met him before. Beautiful guy. Sits down and says, man, you have a great church going on. I said, man, thank you for saying that. I, I know. I'm, I don't take it for granted. Believe me. And he said, what should I do now? Just start coming to church, like services? And I said to him, I just thought, you know, I'm preaching this Sunday. I probably should mention to this guy, there's a Savior. <laughs> it's not just about the church service. I said, you can start coming to church anytime you want. And when you come, make sure you say hello when you come. And I said, have you ever prayed to receive Christ as your Savior? And we were able to do that right there and then. And listen, uh, personal evangelism is not necessarily my gift. 
I'm just telling you, sometime when you put it out there, God will give you opportunities to talk to people about Jesus. Fearless. Fearless. Here's the third thing, positive. There is so much negative in this world. And sometimes I read Christian publications and I think, no wonder no one, people don't want to, not no one, but some people don't want to be part of this. So negative. And there's a time maybe to, to present the negative side of it, but we are to give a reason for the what, for the hope that we have. I, I don't see a lot of that in Christendom today. People are looking for something positive. People are looking for a reason to have hope, a reason to have joy. Did you ever think this? That person will never come to Christ. I just don't think they're ever gonna come to Christ. And then you see somebody else and you think, man, I'd love to see that person come to Christ. Who are you to decide? People come to Christ by grace, not by type. I have found in my life, you never know who God's gonna lead to Christ, right? I've looked at people and said, there's no hope for those people, whoever those people are. I can't imagine them ever coming to Christ. In other words, I'm the kind of person God would choose and not them. I mean, think about the pride that comes with that. I wanna tell you, every one of us is hopeless, but there is hope for every one of us. This gospel is for everyone. That's the great news today. I don't think I'm better material for God than anyone else. Listen, Romans 3 says that no one seeks for God. He's the one that is going and seeking people, drawing people to himself. We need to go with a positivity and a joy and let people see something in us that is different. Because 8 a.m., you're not looking real joyous right now. You know, th there is a joy in the Lord and that joy is our strength. And the world needs to be able to see that joy in us. Do they see that in you? Because many times I look around and I see Christians, you'd never know they're believers because I just don't see a joy in them. You need to be able to give a reason for the hope that you have. Humility, humility, fearlessness, and a positivity. And here's what happens in verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? This idea of being cut to the heart, that word in Greek, this is the only place in the Bible where that appears. They were cut to the heart. And you know what it means? It means they had a contrite heart. You know that word contrite? It means remorse. Like, I need forgiveness. And listen, maybe that's you today. Maybe you're here today and you have a contrite heart <laughs> and you need forgiveness. Jesus offers that forgiveness. And they say, what shall we do? And here's how Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent, all right? That was the message of John the Baptist, repent. Metanoia is the word in, in the original language, and it means to change your mind, to have a paradigm shift, to change direction. If you have sin in your life today, listen, repent. This is the day, right now. God honors those who honor Him. And can I say something to you? Because there is so much sexual sin in the world today, I believe every human being had at some point in their life sexual sin. And it might even be the sin that happens right here. Jesus said, if you think this, you're guilty of it. Listen, if it's sexual sin, someone said, what, what is the, the, the church's view on sexual, human sexuality? One man, one woman in a married monogamous relationship. And if you are engaging in sexuality outside that, I wanna call you to celibacy today and make a decision. I'm gonna honor God with my sexuality from this point forward. God is calling us, calling us to repent. And it may be something that's not, for you it might be bitterness or pride or anger or addiction or racism, metanoia. Repent and be baptized. And the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us. And it says in verse 41, those who accepted his message, there were some that didn't accept the message, but those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. The first church was a church of thousands, like this big church all of a sudden, 
You know, listen, the church cannot save anyone. We are not the truth. We are just bearers of the truth. Bearers of Christ, his message, his word, the message of the cross, the message of the resurrection. We can't save anyone, it is through him. And when we come, we come with a message that the world needs to hear, amen? We come to it, my friends, with humility. We come to it with fearlessness. You're the light bearers of Jesus. You, you are the ambassadors for Jesus. We come to it with fearlessness. Listen, I'm not afraid to let you know that I'm a believer in Jesus. We come to it with fearlessness and we come to it with a positivity, joy. Are you ready, church? Because listen, our nation needs us. They need the message that we have. The message that saves for all of eternity. And what a tremendous opportunity we have. Can I pray together with you? Would you bow with me? And God Almighty, we come with gratitude in knowing that you're with us, you're for us. I thank you that we are here today. It is only by the grace of God that you have saved me, that you have saved us. And so today we come with humility, God, knowing that we are your people, we are your messengers, we are your church, we are the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, God. I pray that we would, as individuals in a church, catch a vision for what you want us to be and how you want us to be, and Lord, who you want us to reach. And I pray that many would come to Christ in and through the ministries of our church here. And we thank you in Jesus' holy name, amen, amen.